Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel today, where we look at this story that's been building and building for quite a while now as to this national medical emergency that is uh, very quickly emerging. The reason this is such a bad situation is because all of this is happening at the worst possible time. If you work in healthcare or if you have someone, family member or, or friend that works in healthcare, they'll tell you that the winter is usually the busiest time in a hospital. And this actually builds upon what's going on, which is a, somewhat a perfect storm right now. In particular, and we'll, we'll go very specific on the United States today, but this also applies to some other countries as well. I would say the USA has got it the worst because of a combination of things that they've done very differently from other countries, including uh, mandates on medical staff, which created an exodus of workers. But there's also a lot of problems with um, actually getting the medications needed and the equipment and hospitals going into administration. In fact, I've got a whole list here. There are uh, drug shortages, medical equipment shortages, PPE shortages, ambulance driver shortages, uh, national nurse shortage, medical examiner shortage, hospitals overloaded, hospitals shutting down and bankrupt. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But I'm just gonna focus today on three key parts which I think are really making the biggest impact and what you'll probably find the most interesting out of all of these different topics. So let's go to the shared screen now and we'll begin with the first article. So we're going to look at different news channels here and uh, source of information from Fox News right through to CBS to CNN to the FDA Gov website. So let's start with Fox then. Drug shortage swells to national emergency forcing doctors to find new ways to treat patients. The nationwide shortage of basic antibiotics and critical medications that treat chronic conditions and bacterial infections has become the latest issue to hit the medical world. Consequently, it is forcing many doctors to rely on alternative medicines to treat patients. What was once an unthinkable situation, a shortage of basic antibiotics such as amoxicillin and augmentin to treat ear and skin infections or even medications such as albuterol to treat asthma is now a harsh reality. So this came from uh, an emergency room physician, Dr. Robert Glatter. Even the shortage of basic medications such as children's Tylenol, integral to treating fever and mild to moderate pain, is impacting our ability to provide care for our patients. Currently, the FDA has a list of more than 180 current or resolved drug shortages. And that is a lot, if you've ever worked in this industry, you know that that is a lot of cases right now. So he's also predicted that the drug shortage problem rippling through the US could last for at least another year, if not longer. Major drugstore chains have also been feeling the effects, especially as flu season ramps up. Walgreens told Fox Business that the company has seen an increased demand for over-the-counter medications. So where's all this coming from then? Well, glad to say the problem is in part because the US is currently facing challenges in obtaining raw materials. That is correct. We know about the supply chain breakdowns. Um, but how much is self-inflicted here? Let's find out. For instance, sourcing materials for manufacturing, the active pharmaceutical ingredients in the majority of drugs comes from China, which is dealing with limited production and output of raw materials involved in pharmaceutical manufacturing due to rigid lockdown measures. Now, we know that that is starting to lift, so hopefully this will uh, help to resolve this situation a little bit. The US is also dependent on India for a significant number of generic medications, but India also relies on China for the raw materials used to produce active pharmaceutical ingredients, he added. Now, if we look at what's going on here, this is what we've been you know, speaking about previously, that there's just too much reliance on China for so many things from raw materials right through to finished goods and the labor pool, using their labor pool. But we also have this issue with this year's flu season, which according to the medical experts is a lot worse than normal. I can't really comment on that. I'm not a 
medical guy. I can only give you statistics. Uh, Nebraska is one of about a dozen states listed by the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, as having very high flu activity. And they're saying that we could face a triple demic in the coming months due to CV19, flu, and RSV all culminating at the exact same time. That number of cases is much higher this early in the season than at any time in the last three years, according to their health department. But what else is happening? Well, they're reporting a rapid increase in flu cases. Most cases have been in children aged six to 19, but the department said that cases in adults as well, 20 to 64, are trending higher. Continuing on with the child aspect then, the demand for hospital grade cribs is on the rise as viral illnesses continue to surge. Pediatric hospital beds have been more full than usual for months. Last month, children's health leaders called for a formal emergency declaration from the US government. Let me just say that again a formal emergency declaration from the US government to support hospitals and communities amid an alarming surge of pediatric respiratory illnesses, including RSV and the flu, along with the continuing children's mental health emergency. And we know how this was created. Over to CNN Health then, RSV hospitalization rate for seniors is 10 times higher than usual for this point in the season. The respiratory virus season has started early in kids this year and flooded children's hospitals in many parts of the country, especially with RSV. This season, about six out of every 100,000 seniors has been hospitalized with RSV, according to data from the US CDC. That's significantly lower than the rate for children, but still uncharacteristically high. In the years before the CV-19 pandemic, hospitalization rates for seniors were about 10 times lower at this point in the season. So if you wanna see the evidence of what I'm talking about here, you can head on over to the FDA website, drug shortages, and just scroll down, and you can just see this huge list of how many are still currently in shortage and how many are resolved. Uh, it is uh, honestly a huge list here. Let's get to the bottom and it will tell us 185 entries. Now that is absolutely huge, but just bear in mind some of these are now resolved. Let's move on to the second part of this crisis then. And this is about staffing. So we'll start with nurses and we'll move on to a couple of others. But let's begin with this article here, nursing burnout. Nurses worry shortage will worsen if measures aren't taken. And they've just done a poll, so they've surveyed nurses. 34% of nurses admitted they were very likely to quit by the end of 2022. So that is this month, because nurses are pleading for more support amid the ongoing nursing shortage crisis. And Ladies and gents, this really is a crisis right now, which had been building prior to the pandemic and continues to take a mental and physical toll on workers. It's gotten to the point where many are walking away from the job in tears, according to Karen Fountain, an ER level one trauma nurse. Nurses are walking out of the building several times a week, crying or crying while they're in the building, trying to take care of more patients than they're able to. She said, we don't want to offer poor care and we do our best not to. But when you have the ratio of nurses that they have right now, there's no way to deliver the best health care that they want to deliver. According to a March survey from Incredible Health, 34% of nurses said that they will likely quit their jobs by the end of the year. About 44% of nurses said burnout and the high stress environment is the driving force behind their decision to quit by the end of the year. Fountain said another issue is that nurses are calling off more than ever before, so calling off sick. And this also includes those that don't get compensated for sick days. 
They're exhausted and they're not afraid to say, I need an emotional day. I am emotionally overwrought, she added. Nursing is burnout. We were burned out from the virus and now we're entering another season where this flu season is going to be awful. Someone else warned that if things don't change soon, the industry will likely continue to see a decline in quality of care and patient outcome. Solving the nursing shortage crisis isn't going to be easy, but Fountain projected that the crisis will get worse if the medical industry doesn't bring more nurses into the field as quickly as we can. The Labor Department reported that the unprecedented demands that the pandemic placed on the nation's nurses, combined with retirements and an aging workforce, have greatly increased the need for nursing workers in the US. So look at this statistic. The department projected that more than 275,000 additional nurses will be needed for the next decade. So what is being done about this, you may ask then? Well, there is a lot of money now pouring into nursing as well as a lot of charities and a lot of colleges and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, let's look at this article and I'll show you where this money is actually going to. The nursing shortage keeps getting worse and foundations and major donors are pouring in millions to stem the tide. A $125 million donation in February to the University of Pennsylvania to create a tuition-free program that eventually will train 40 nurses a year. This gift is designed to extend for decades, uh, which is great. That's very generous. But when you've got a shortage of 275,000, 40 nurses a year is really just a drop in the ocean as to what is needed. The UHF, the United Health Foundation, said in June it would devote $100 million to finance the training of 10,000 nursing and other clinical students who are people of color or have low incomes. And, you know, there's loads of these. I'm not going to go through them all because there's a lot of donations that are coming in. Uh, more than 100,000 nurses, or 1.8% of the nationwide workforce, left the field in 2021, according to an April study published in the Journal of Health Affairs. Now, I just want to correct something here, because we keep hearing this, that all of these nurses and all these doctors and healthcare workers just decided to leave in, in 2021. Well, this is a lie. This is just not true. Yes, some people, some medical people, decided willingly to leave the industry in 2021. That is true, that is a fact. But what they're also, and none of these media art outlets will say this, a lot of these people, the people in the medical field, were forced out of their job as well. And this was due to mandates, a lot of people, medical people didn't wanna get these shots. And you notice I'm using words like shots and CV because otherwise the, this video will get shadow banned and all sorts of other problems for me. But this is actually what happened. A lot of these medical staff were forced out of their job. They were in effect fired, although th those words weren't used. They were just told not to come back to their job and that you know X day was their last day in work. So this is the other problem. Part of this is self-inflicted by the you know the healthcare industry as a whole and hospitals and you know all these all these policies so they go on to say the flight from the profession wasn't a case of older nurses retiring the bulk of nurses leaving were under the age of 35 and more are headed for the exit according to a study from consulting firm McKinsey and Company, which found that 22% of frontline nurses plan to leave their positions in the next year, an increase from the 16% who said that in 2019. And by the way, this is a, a, a recent article. It just came out uh, yesterday. So we'll move on to the third part now, and this is all around bankruptcies and um, other issues. So you've got equipment, which we're not going to focus on too heavily, but there's a lot of bankruptcies in hospitals, a lot of um, financial issues, shall we say. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this now. Michigan hospitals lost 1,700 beds from staff shortages. Hospitals say they will have spent $1 billion more in labor costs this year in recruitment, retention, and pay for temporary workers. And what's going on in San Diego then? Well, you have this company offering a $50,000 signing bonus for paramedics amid a nationwide shortage. 
The company that provides emergency medical services to San Diego announced it will offer $50,000 signing bonuses to recruit paramedics amid a nationwide shortage. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this is that it's not just for the paramedic, but they're also offering a $10,000 bonus to any employees who refer new full-time paramedics to work in San Diego. So there we go. If you're working in hospital right now and you know someone that might be about to join, just quickly, you know, give them the nudge and put your name down so you can get that, that sign-on bonus. Uh, next then, US hospitals are closing as demand for care increases. And this is one of the big problems. We know right now that the, the demand on healthcare is increasing. We're seeing it throughout the world. We're seeing this massive demand now, this big spike um, right throughout, well, from the middle of 2022 and certainly through to now, we're seeing this greater demand, especially as we go into the winter period. But the problem is the healthcare system is somewhat overwhelmed. Of course, they say every year the same thing. We're at breaking point. You know, any day could be the, the, the straw that breaks the, the camel's back. Of course, it never does break, but that is, you know, what gets put out every year. But I do feel that this year is a little bit different because we've had this build up over the last two and a half years, let's say, where a lot of treatments got cancelled or put back. There's this huge waiting list. And now you've got less staff, you've got less hospital beds, you've got a lot more problems, less um, drugs and pharmaceuticals that are needed. You've got more hospitals closing down. Um, there's all these things happening at an alarming rate and you have a lot more migration coming into the West. And, and of course, people who come from, maybe they're seeking asylum or whatever else is happening. A lot of people that come from poorer nations often tend to have a lot more health problems. So they create a, a bigger draw on the healthcare system as well. So we have all of these things that are going on at the exact same time. So we have declining revenue and increasing expenses contributing to a growing number of hospital closures in the United States. In the past year, 19 hospitals have filed for bankruptcy, closed or announced plans to close. In addition, Berwick Hospital Center in Pennsylvania filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on September 30th. The filing took place less than two weeks after the hospital had shut down its emergency department due to a lack of staffing. On the same day, Blessing Health System in Illinois closed its hospital, citing low inpatient volume, which is quite interesting. The Tennessee-based Franklin Community Health Systems closed Shorepoint Health Venice, a 312-bed hospital in Venice, Florida in September as well. Many hospitals that remain open face dire financial straits. In September, the AHA projected that between 53% and 68% of the nation's hospitals will end 2022 in debt. This means a potential doubling of the 34% of hospitals that were in debt by the end of 2019. This debt will not only prompt consolidations and layoffs, but also flood surviving hospitals with more patients when they are already at capacity. In my 35 years as a healthcare leader, this is the most fragile I've ever seen the American healthcare system, said Jack Lynch, the president and CEO of MLH. Now, this president and CEO, who I can't pronounce his name, but Mike Slobowski, uh, I've highlighted in red here, total salary, $2,866,730. Wow, that is a, a nice salary to have. Um, so he's the CEO of the 88 Hospital Trinity Health, and he said his organization has 3,900 vacant registered nurse positions and a 14% clinical support staff vacancy rate. Staff shortages are like nothing we've ever seen before, he said, reporting that Trinity had to take 13% of its emergency departments, 12% of its beds, and 5% of its operating rooms offline. So as you can see, ladies and gents, this is not a good situation for, in particular, healthcare in the United States. But I can pretty much guarantee a lot of this will have ripple effects to other Western nations. Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and parts of mainland Europe as well. You can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be ripple effects 
elsewhere. So that is you up to date today then on this emerging crisis in the healthcare system, not just in the United States, but also in other Western countries as well. And this is why it's also so important to stay as healthy as you possibly can. Remember, prevention is always much better than cure. All right, that's all for today. Take care, God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow.